as I said, that for a person to be crucified, he should be put to death on the cross. If he does not die on the cross, he is not crucified. The real thing is, Jesus Christ's peace be upon him was alive. For a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. Just to make easy for the pastor in the rebuttal time he has, I list the major points proving that he was not crucified, he was not resurrected. Zocker Knight claims that when Jesus says that he will fulfill the sign of Jonah, that he was actually saying that he would never die, he would never die by crucifixion, and he would never rise from the dead. That, of course, is nonsense. And I disprove that in another video. I'll leave the link in the description box. But Zocker Knight also uses the sign of Jonah to say that Jesus never rose from the dead. The sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, alive, alive, alive. If he's alive, no crucifixion, no resurrection. So in short, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, according to the Bible, but he did not die. So what Zocker Nike is teaching is the old swoon theory. Yes, that's what Zocker Nike is teaching, that Jesus was put on a cross, but he didn't die on the cross. He was taken off of the cross alive, put in a tomb alive, and came out of a tomb alive. That's his claim. And so since Zocker Nike uses Bible references to try and prove that Jesus never rose from the dead, I'll do the same thing. I'm going to use the Bible to disprove what he teaches. Now I'm going to run through these references and you will see that Zocker Nike is lying through his teeth. First of all, we have to look at the motivations for why Jesus was actually crucified in the first place. From the Jewish perspective, Jesus went to trial, and at his trial he claimed to be the Son of Man, a divine figure from the Old Testament. He claimed to be the Son of God, God in the flesh, and the high priest said he blasphemed the name of God. That's why the Jews wanted him dead, because he claimed to be God, and in their mind that was blasphemy, even though it was the truth. He was God in the flesh. But they didn't understand that, and they were against Jesus and his claims. At least they understood Jesus' claims, that he did claim to be the Son of God, unlike Zocher Nike. But they understood exactly who Jesus claimed to be, and they wanted him dead. So what they did is they took him to Pilate and convinced Pilate that Jesus was a threat to the kingdom, that he was a threat to the Roman kingdom. He was going to uh, claim to be a king of the Jews and create this big revolt. That was basically their claim against Jesus to Pontius Pilate. Now we have to answer this question, why was Pilate there in the first place? It's simple. He was there because it was Passover. Now history tells us that the Jews frequently revolted during the time of Passover against the Roman authorities. And so what the Romans would do, they knew that there would be hundreds of thousands of Jews there in Jerusalem for the time of Passover. And so they would bring in all of these extra troops and the Roman prefect himself would come and, and keep watch over the temple area and make sure that there were no re insurrections, no rebellions. And so that's why he was there. And so that's why he was easily convinced to put Jesus to death because they were whipping up a crowd. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that the, the high priest and the rest of his cronies were whipping up the crowd, shouting at Pilate to crucify Jesus, basically cre creating a mob and a riot scene. And Pilate thought in his mind he had no choice. He must put him to death to calm everyone down so there would not be a revolt breaking out right there at Jerusalem. So that was their motivations. The Jews wanted him dead because Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh, the Son of God, the Son of Man, their judge, that's who Jesus claimed to be, and Pilate wanted him dead on behalf of Rome just in case he was someone who would rise, rebel against Rome and challenge their authority. So that's two highly motivated agencies that want Jesus dead. 
And before Jesus was even crucified, he was scourged. Now let's take a look at what a scourging actually entails. It is important to recognize it is not Jesus' divinity which makes his crucifixion remarkable, but his humanity. Jesus in his essence is God, but his body was human. Jesus could feel pain and anxiety the same way you or I can feel it. And yet he chose to save us and carry his cross rather than save himself. The Romans had some of the most advanced medical and scientific knowledge for their day, which they applied to many facets of their society. This included punishment, developing crucifixion to be as excruciating and slow of a method of torture and execution as possible. The first stage of Roman crucifixion was scourging, also known as the pre-death. The victim was stripped completely naked and shackled to a post in which they were immobile and helpless. Though many depictions of crucifixion, including that of Jesus, show him draped in a loincloth to preserve his dignity, this historically would not have been the case. Crucifixion was designed not only to be painful, but also humiliating. Once in place, two Roman torturers would stand on either side of the condemned and beat him with canes. This would create welts and bruises to form, and the skin to become more sensitive for the actual scourging. Afterwards, each torturer would change their cane for a whip, called a flagrum. The flagrum was similar to a cat of nine tails, having anywhere from six to nine leather strands of various lengths. On the ends of these strands were tied lead balls, metal blades, bones, and shards of glass. The lead balls were intended to bruise the skin and cause the blood vessels below the skin surface to vasodilate, increasing sensitivity of pain receptors. The metal, bones, and glass were designed to rip and tear away the victim's skin from their flesh. With even one strike on a man's flesh, gruesome damage would occur to the skin of the victim. It was Jewish law that a Jewish citizen could not be struck more than 40 times in a flogging. If a Jew was persecuted under Jewish trial, the condemned would be struck usually 39 times, just to make sure they didn't go over 40. The Romans, however, took much pleasure in insulting Jewish traditions, and often went well over 40 strikes just to spite a Jewish prisoner. The Roman torturers would strike a victim tens of times all over the body, front and back, and head to toe. This would include strikes all over the back, legs, buttocks, calves, shins, stomach, chest, shoulders, arms, neck, and genitals. Remember, the victim was completely naked. By the end of the process, the condemned would have the skin from their entire body torn to pieces. It was described that the scourging process left a man's flesh looking like ribbons, sometimes partially exposing a man's skeleton. The flagrum was designed to dig deep enough to cause bleeding, but not so much that it would puncture vital organs, causing premature death. There are even accounts of some prisoners having their abdominal walls torn open during the scourging process, causing intestines to spill out. It is therefore understandable that death sometimes did occur in this stage, as it was so violent. Now let's take a look at what crucifixion actually entails. The fourth stage of crucifixion is hanging on the cross until death. Although during this stage, the torturers are not actively participating in the victim's suffering, there is still much being inflicted upon him to increase his agony exponentially. With every breath, the victim must lift his body up by pushing up on his nailed feet. This would cause the open wounds on his back from the scourging to scrape on splintered wood. Blood, feces, and urine would be covering the stipes of the cross over time as the victim hung there exposed to the elements of weather, sun, wind, and rain, as well as scavengers like crows and vultures picking at him. A victim would usually take a few days to die, though he could be dead in a matter of hours. If a victim was not dying quick enough to the torturer's liking, they could do a few things to hasten his death, such as breaking the legs of the condemned with a club so he could not push himself up to breathe, piercing the victim's heart with a spear, lighting the cross and victim on fire. Jesus did not survive that. And keep in mind, there was a centurion there that was putting Jesus to death. He was in charge of the crucifixion. And this centurion, if Jesus did not die, somehow he made it off the cross and the Roman prisoner didn't die, he would be killed himself. So the centurion had high, was highly motivated to make sure that Jesus never came off of that cross alive and that's what happened in fact the bible says that they were going to break jesus's legs to hasten his death now how would this make jesus die more quickly it's simply because when someone was crucified they were they would die by asphyxiation they would be smothered to death they couldn't get air in their lungs because of the where how they hung and so they would have to push up on their feet 
and draw in breath. And so if their legs were broken, they couldn't draw in fresh breath and they would die more quickly. But they noticed that Jesus was already dead. That's why they didn't break his legs. And the centurion thrust a spear, had a spear thrust through his side that pierced Jesus' heart and brought out fluid and blood out of his wound. And the centurion knew that Jesus was dead. There was no way this centurion was going to let Jesus come off of that cross alive. Jesus died by crucifixion. And the Bible says that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two of Jesus' disciples, took Jesus' body off of the cross and prepared it for his burial with spices and with wraps. And women also came and put spices on Jesus' body, which means that the disciples knew, these disciples knew Jesus was dead. (laughs) They would not have put Jesus in that tomb if he was still alive. They knew he was dead. And the scriptures also say that the Jews were aware of Jesus' prophecy, something that Zachernike is totally clueless about, apparently, that Jesus made the prophecy several times that he would die by crucifixion, be buried for three days, and he would rise from the dead alive. That was his claim. And the Jews were aware of this claim. And so they went to Pilate and told Pilate his prophecy. Now, they didn't expect Jesus to rise from the dead. They thought that his body would be stolen by his disciples, and then they would claim that Jesus rose from the dead. So what the guard, what the Romans did, they put a guard on the tomb. And not only that, when Jesus was buried, they rolled a two-ton stone in front of the entranceway, put their seal of approval on that stone, And this was a wax seal, meaning that the Roman government acknowledged that the body inside the tomb was dead and that no one was to steal that dead body. And they put Roman guards, or it possibly could be temple guards, from people from stealing the body. So Jesus is in the tomb. There's a two-ton stone in front of the tomb, and there's guards there in front of the tomb. So, Zucker Knight's claim is this. Put this in your mind, my dear Muslim friends. Picture this. Jesus is scourged. He's crucified, hung on a cross, and he survives that. Not only that, he has all of these wounds all over his body, and he had a crown of thorns put on his head, which means his scalp was lacerated he was bleeding profusely from his head from all over his body from the scourging he was put in the tomb a two-ton stone was rolled in front of the tomb a seal of approval was put on and there were guards there in front of the tomb so jesus somehow survived all of that shoved a two-ton stone out of the way under his own strength beat up the guards and escaped (laughs) This is sheer foolishness, but that is what had to have happened if Zachernike's swoon theory were true. And not only that, the, the, the folly goes even further. Here's Jesus. This is how Zachernike presents this. Jesus, scourged within an inch of his life, hung on a cross, never died, put into a tomb, shoves a two-ton stone out of the way, Beats up guards, I guess, or then he started to appear to his disciples. And Jesus would have been half dead, blood all over his body, infections, wounds, pus all over him, bleeding. The disciples would have gone and got a doctor. They would not have worshipped him as the risen Lord. And the first people that saw Jesus from the tomb were the women. And the women didn't go and get help. He wasn't half dead, staggering around. They saw him for who he was, the risen Savior with a glorified body. And picture this. They would have to have, surely they would have gone and gotten help. And then after that, Jesus staggers, what, a half a mile to where the other disciples are and appears to them. And then the disciples, what do they do? They didn't go and get a doctor. What was wrong with them? Why did they see 
Jesus there and start worshiping as him as God? Why did they start preaching that he was the risen Lord? Why did they start preaching that he was God in the flesh sent to deliver man from their sin by his death and resurrection from the dead? Why did they start preaching that message right out of the gate if the, if the fact was that Jesus never died? It makes no sense. The swoon theory makes no sense. Why would the disciples worship a half-dead guy who never died? They would have just been glad that he didn't die. They'd say, hey, great. Our prophet, our rabbi didn't die. Hey, let's get, let's fix him up. Uh, let's get him a doctor. And, you know, that's that. But no, that's not their message. Their message was he died by crucifixion. He was buried and he rose from the dead and he appeared to them alive in a glorified body. He didn't have wounds all over his body when he appeared to them. He had just the nail prints in his hands and in his feet to prove and the and the wound in his side from the spear to prove that it was him in his glorified body. And right away, my dear Muslim friends, his disciples understood that Jesus was God in the flesh sent to rescue mankind from their sins because he died by crucifixion and he rose from the dead. And all of those prophecies came back to their mind when they saw Jesus risen from the dead. It all started to click. His teaching about who he was, God in the flesh, he was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the Son of Man. He was the Son of God. He was the divine the Son of God. All of those teachings finally sunk in when they saw Jesus risen from the dead. And not only that, Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples teaching them the doctrine he wanted them to preach. Before he ascended to heaven, the disciples witnessed with their own eyeballs the resurrected Jesus ascend from Jerusalem to his throne in heaven. They saw this happen. So they knew that Jesus was telling the truth, that He was Lord, He was Savior, and He was the risen King, and He's sitting on God's right hand today. That's the gospel message, my dear Muslim friends. And Zachar Nike's Jonah theory of the swoon theory does not work. It's sheer foolishness. When you put it up, his argument up against the facts that are laid out in the scriptures it makes his theory look foolish. Jesus did die by crucifixion. There's no doubt. He was buried in a tomb and his disciples believed that he had risen from the dead. And immediately they started preaching this message to the world. And not only that, if they thought that Jesus survived the cross, survived a three-day burial in the tomb with all of those wounds they would not have died for the message that they preached. You see, all of the disciples, the originals, uh, history tells us that they died for their faith. And what was their faith? They died believing that Jesus was the risen Lord. That was their message. Jesus was the Son of God, the King of kings, risen from the dead. And why would they die for a lie? Something they knew that was a lie. If they knew it was all a scam, if it, Jesus really didn't die, hey, let's make up this story. We know Jesus didn't really die, but let's make up this story to try and, and convince people that Jesus was Lord, He was the Savior, He was the risen King. And once the pressure started hitting them, why did they just say, okay, it's a lie? Why would they give their lives for what they knew to be a lie? They would have not done that, and they didn't do that. They gave their lives knowing in their hearts that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what they died believing, and that's why they died preaching. That's what they preached. Not this fake gospel that's in the Quran, not this this stuff in the Quran that says Jesus was not Lord, He's not the Son of God, He never died on, by crucifixion, and He never rose from the dead. That is the complete opposite of the truth, my dear Muslim friends. The truth will save your soul. The truth is that Jesus is Lord. He died for your sins and rose from the dead. That is the truth. 
and the Quran and the Hadiths and the Tafsirs and everything that says that Jesus is not Lord, He didn't die on the cross and He never rose from the dead, is a lie. And you can see from Zacher Nike, his silly argument, all these hoops he has to jump through, this swoon theory to show that Jesus never died, how silly. My dear Muslim friends, use your logical brain and see that Zacher Nike has no clue as to what he's talking about. He's completely clueless and he's lying through his teeth to you to keep you from becoming a follower of Jesus. That's what it's all about. There's a built-in mechanism in Islam, my dear Muslim fans. Here's, here's the truth. Shirk is built into your system to keep you from being saved. Because the truth is Jesus is Lord. He died for your sins and He rose from the dead. And Shirk says if you believe that, you can never be forgiven. You're certain to go to hell forever if you believe that. And that is the truth. So you see how Islam is lying about Jesus. In the scriptures, the Bible, the New Testament tells the truth about who Jesus is. And what he wants to do for you, my dear Muslim friends, is to save you from the lie, save you from the false religion of Islam, because he loves you. He loves you, my dear Muslim friends, even though you reject him, even though you mock the cross, and you mock everything that's in the Bible that teaches that Jesus is Lord. You mock all of that, but He still doesn't hate you. He still loves you and desires for you to come to Him as your Lord, as His Lord, as Lord and Savior, and He will save you. The Bible makes you a promise, my dear Muslim friends. If you want to repent today, leave that false religion of Islam behind. It's it's really simple. The Bible gives you a promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you, my dear Muslim friends. And if you decide today to leave Zacher Nike, all that silliness, all those false arguments against the Bible and against Jesus, and all those silly lies in the Quran, in the Hadiths, in the Tafsirs, against the truth of who Jesus really is, if you leave all that behind, call upon His name today, you will be saved. You will be rescued and you will be a follower of the King Jesus. Will you do that today, my dear Muslim friends? If you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you will never regret it.